Welcome back! So in this tutorial I'm going to cover some of the basic techniques that we would initially cover in an intro to investments class using Bloomberg. So I'm going to show you how to do a couple of things. First I'm going to show you how to analyze a specific security. I'm going to show you how to get some basic information about that security in Bloomberg and I'm also going to show you how to collect data on IPOs and M&As and also we'll talk about how to get some basic line graphs of some indicators. So let's get started. In this tutorial I'm going to use Tesla as my primary example. So let's get some basic information about Tesla. To get started I'm going to type in Tesla's ticker symbol up here in the function bar. So TSLA. Now when I type in TSLA I can I have the option to look at the information that Bloomberg has on Elon Musk, uh, also Tesla's CEO, and some of the other individuals associated with the firm. But below that, we have the ability to take a look at Tesla's U.S. Common Equity. So that's what this is, Tesla Inc. U.S. So I'm going to go ahead and select this. Now, when I select this, what you can see is our main menu. And this is what you're always going to see when you look up a particular security. It has a main menu and gives us the option to identify exactly what data we're trying to collect about Tesla. So we can look up its basic description and some of the dashboard characteristics about Tesla. We can also use the financial analysis tab to collect essentially any information that's ever occurred in the firm's income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flows, etc. We can also look up any ownership information we would want to know about Tesla. and. If we want to, we can also plot Tesla's share price or any other characteristic of Tesla in a line chart. There's a bunch of other functions here, but I'll get into them in some later videos. All right, let's get started. I'm going to start by clicking on the Security Description tab. So when you click on the Security Description tab, we have some basic information. Bloomberg is going to tell us what Tesla does, how the company makes its money, etc., we also have a one-year price chart here, and below that we have the 52-week high and low of the stock price, and the year-to-date change in that stock price. We can also look at the market capitalization of the stock, and that's just number of shares times shares outstanding. So what we can see here is that as of right now, when I'm recording this video, Tesla's market capitalization is about $59.6 billion. We can also identify the number of shares Tesla has outstanding. So that's about 171.7 million. And this float, which is this 125.6 million, that's the number of shares that could actually be traded, that are not locked up. Now, over here under the estimates, we have the date of their next earnings uh, report. So the date their earnings will be released, their next quarterly earnings will be released. So that's February 6th. 2019. We also have some information on their PE ratios or price to earnings ratios. So as you can see, both of these are NA. And the reason they're NA instead of some value is because anytime a company has negative earnings or negative expected, earning, expected earnings, we're going to report our PE ratio as NA or blank or with a dash sign. You never report negative PE ratios. So this P-E ratio right here, this P slash E, is their trailing P-E ratio. It's just the current share price of 347.26 divided by their historical earnings per share, uh, whatever that might happen to be. Clearly, it's negative. Uh, next below this, we have their forward P-E ratio. And the forward P-E ratio is the current share price, again, this, uh, divided by their forecasted earnings. So in this case, the earnings that are being forecasted are the earnings uh, that are expected to uh, be recorded on this date or reported on this date. Uh, now over here on the corporate info tab, we have their website, where they're headquartered, and number of employees as of 12-31-2017. We also have their management, and we can get some more information on these individuals if we just click on it. Uh, we also can get some information on the firm's beta, which we'll talk about later in this course. Under the Issue Info tab, we can get some information on 
the company's exchange, so the particular stock exchange where the company's shares trade. In this case, Tesla shares trade on the NASDAQ. We can also see that the company is incorporated in the United States, it's a US company, and it's incorporated in the state of Delaware, which has a symbol, a two character symbol of DE. Most corporations in the US are incorporated in Delaware for a variety of reasons, one of which is that it has some pretty good case law. Uh, we can see down here the QSIP of Tesla, so that's just the unique identifier of the company's common equity. And over here, under institutional holdings, we can see that about 1,014 financial institutions own shares of Tesla, and those institutions own about 120 million shares of the company's stock, and those 120.59 million shares represent about 70.2% of the shares outstanding. And that represents about 95.8% of the shares that are currently floating out there. Uh, below that, we can also see that corporate insiders, so managers, employees, board members, hold about 21.84% of the shares that are outstanding. Most of these are owned by Elon Musk, who owns 19.7 million shares. Now, if we go over to the ratios tab, we can see a lot of the headlining ratios that we would normally care about if we're doing some market multiples analysis. So over here, we have the last price of Tesla. Uh, obviously, if you look down at our time, uh, Tesla is not currently trading. The market isn't open until 9.30, so... Uh, Tesla is, uh, its share price won't change in the next few minutes. Uh, we also have their PE ratio, which I just mentioned, and their, their price to book ratio, or PB ratio, their price to sales ratio is here, and their market cap is currently right here. Their current enterprise value is listed here, so that's just market cap plus debt, or total liabilities, minus cash. Now over here, we can also look at their book price per share, which is 26.28, and we can also get a sense of their profitability. So their bid to earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization is listed here. Uh, their EBIT is listed right here. That's just earnings before interest and taxes. ROA, ROE, both listed right here. And over here, we can see their price to cash flow, which is 43.1 which is extremely high. Next, I'm going to take a look at some other information. So if I want to get back to the main menu for Tesla's data, all I have to do is click the back button, which is located next to the delete button on your keypad. So let's go ahead and look under the financial analysis tab. Like I said, the Financial Analysis tab is going to have just about every piece of information that has ever been recorded by Tesla on its financial statements. So this is their income statement, their balance sheet, and their statement of cash flows. And the key stats are always going to be reported straight away. So the first thing we see is not necessarily on their uh, financial statements. It's their market cap. So their market cap as of certain points in time. So their market cap right here is their market cap as of September 30th, 2018, which is about $59.6 billion. We can also see their market cap historically, and notice here that we have annual information. If we want to get quarterly information about Tesla's market cap, or their cash, or their enterprise value, or what have you, all we have to do is go up to the periodicity uh, indicator and change that from annual to quarters, and you'll see that it changes straight away. So we have now quarterly data, or data for each quarter, or at the end of each quarter. So I'm going to go back to annual just because I prefer annual unless I need something else. Uh, now we also have a bunch of other information under the key stats tab. Uh, one of the pieces of information that's going to become very important when we do valuation is the free cash flow, which is listed down here. Notice here that we have historical information, say historical free cash flow or historical market cap, and we also have forecasted free cash flow, which is right here. So we're going to use this information later on in the course. Next, if I want to see information on the income statement, I can. 
It's just under the I slash S tab. So we have their revenue at certain points in time. So at the end of the last fiscal year, at the end of the previous fiscal year, etc. We can also look at their net income available to common shares. And we can also look at their basic earnings per share, uh, earning per, earnings per share listed under gap rules. And we can see some other information like the EBITDA or the EBIT. Now if we go over to the B slash S tab, you can see their balance sheet information historically. Uh, so feel free to make use of that data if you ever need it. Now, if I go over to the C slash F tab, like I said, this is their statement of cash flows. We won't use this data too often just because we are in finance and not accounting. We tend to focus a little more on the income statement and the balance sheet. But if you get into some serious financial analysis, the statement of cash flows is still pretty important. Next, if we go over to the ratios tab, we can see some of their basic ratios historically. So here's a bunch of ratios that we saw on their company description section. So return on equity, return on assets, uh, EBITDA margin, operating margin, net income margin, profit margin, etc. Uh, so if we wanted to make use of that, we certainly could. If we wanted to do a DuPont analysis, we could just click this tab, but we won't bother with that. And that's that on the financial analysis tab. We'll probably dive more into this tab later on in this course, but for now, this is really all you need. So let's go back to the main menu. All right, so I'm back on the main menu. Now, let's take a look at this ownership summary tab. Now, the ownership summary tab tells us who owns whatever security we're looking at. It could be stock, it could be a bond, it could be something else. Uh, but obviously this is Tesla stock. So right away, as I click this tab, you can see that institutional owners own about 70.22% of the shares outstanding as of January 6th, 2019. Uh, if I wanted to know the number of institutions, here it is. It's basically some of that information I showed you straight away uh, at the beginning of this video. Uh, we can also see where the shareholders of this company's shares are. About half of them, or slightly more than half of them, are in the US. Some we don't know. Those are probably private LLCs, shell companies perhaps. Uh, we can also see the fact that about 12% of the company's shareholders are in the UK, 5% in Hong Kong, about half a percent in Switzerland. Uh, if we wanted to see that the shares held by insiders, that's right here. We've already talked about that. We can also take a look at the percent of shares owned by investment advisors. That's typically going to be uh, investment banks. Uh, about 21% are owned by individuals and a smaller percent are owned by, say, governments like the government of Japan or China or some other country. Now, if we wanted to look at the insider transactions, we can actually get a sense of which of the company insiders, aka board members or uh, high-level managers, are buying and selling shares or executing or exercising their stock options. So let's say we take a look at this point in time. Linda Rice Johnson is uh, exercising sh some options on 1,700 shares. Uh, and then selling those shares immediately on the open market. So essentially she's uh, cashing out her her, uh, her call options that she likely receives as a director of the company. Let's go back. Uh, so you can kind of get a sense of what's happening. Typically these green indicators indicate that an insider is buying shares. The red indicators indicate that an insider is selling shares or exercising options and then selling those shares. Yellow indicates a neutral. Uh, there is some financial research out there on the academic side that indicates that corporate ins insiders tend to buy shares when they believe the share price is low and sell shares abnormally when they believe that the share price is high. It's pretty much what you'd expect. 
So that's about all I wanted to show you with regard to the basic functions that you'll need uh, when looking up specific data. Now let's talk about some uh, additional tools that you need when you're looking up transactions in the global marketplace. So I'm going to go back to the main menu by hitting the back button. And now, actually, let's just go back to the main screen by hitting the escape button. Next, I'm going to look up a specific IPO that I might want to be analyzing. So when you look up an IPO or initial public offering, all you need to do is type in IPO in your function bar. And that's going to give you the opportunity to look at some various equity offerings. So the very first thing we see here is exactly what we want. So here we have our IPO uh, manager. So we can see all of the IPOs that have occurred recently. These are some of our largest deals. So SoftBank is undertook an IPO on 11-12-2018 and raised about $21 billion in capital. And the shares traded at about 1,433. That may be yen at the end of the first trading day. All right, now let's say we want to look at some IPOs over a specific point in time. What you see here is just the big IPOs in the last 12 months. If we wanted to restrict our observations based on time, all we'd have to do is go up to this Announced button or drop-down bar and select a custom date or say the last seven days. Uh, so let's say we wanted to look at all of the IPOs that occurred between 1-14-2016 and 1-14-2017. All I'd have to do is hit enter, and we're going to get a list of the top deals. We can sort based on size, we can sort based on offer price, we can do just about anything we want. Uh, now, one thing I should note is that we have a couple of different types of issuances here. I've talked only about IPOs so far, so initial public offerings, but you'll also see some ADDLs. So these are additional offerings. These could be rights offerings or secondary equity offerings. Basically, they mean that the company in question is issuing new shares even though it's already undertaken an IPO. So for example, this, let's say, CNPC Capital is issuing about, well, a certain number of shares when it's already undertaken an IPO and it's raising an additional 2.8 billion dollars in capital. Now over here on our offer stage we can sort based on the stage of the offer. So perhaps the offer is pending, perhaps it's already been priced, uh, perhaps those shares are already trading. Uh, given the time period that we're looking at most of those are going to be trading and then a lot have been postponed but obviously that's a very small number and then finally a couple are occasionally withdrawn or rejected over this time period. We can also restrict our search based on geographic area. So let's say we want to look at IPOs from Asia or North America. We can. Uh, we can also restrict our search based on a specific industry, say the financial industry. So here we have all of the deals that took place over this time period in the financial industry. If I wanted to restrict it further, I could just select uh, financial industry in Asia, and let's say we only look at the IPOs that are that actually went through and those shares are publicly trading. So here we have a list of them. All right, that's that. Now let's say we want to look at something a little different. Let's say we want to look at a merger or an acquisition. We certainly could do that. Uh, so over here, all I'd have to do in the function bar is type merger. And if I click on merger, I can get a sense of which companies are undertaking an acquisition or a merger. So what you see immediately is that today, as of 1-14-2019, hopefully this video doesn't get a little uh, uh, old before I update it, uh, what you can see is that Newpont Mining uh, Newmont Mining Corp is 
uh, attempting to acquire Gold Corp Incorporated. So we see some consolidation in the mining sector, the, in particular the gold mining sector. Uh, this deal is pending. Uh, what that means is that it's probably in the hands of the regulatory authorities, notably in the U.S. that's going to be the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, or the Department of Justice Antitrust Division. And the deal is valued at about $12.6 billion, and New Newmont Mining Corp. is offering both cash and stock in order to incentivize Gold Corp.'s shareholders to give up their stock. Uh, so uh, that's that. If we wanted to restrict our deals to a specific point in time, we certainly could by using this drop-down bar. And if we wanted to look at deals that are pending, completed, proposed, withdrawn, we certainly could. Uh, so completed, that's obvious. Proposed, that generally means that an acquirer has made an offer to a target, and withdrawn means that the deal has just been withdrawn by the, the acquirer. Uh, maybe that means that the acquirer has determined that the deal would not pass the regulatory authorities. Maybe, it, say for example, creates a monopoly and uh, the deal the authorities would reject the offer. Uh, we can also re restrict our mergers by certain geographic areas, and again we can restrict our mergers by uh, target industry. Now, one thing I didn't talk about with regard to the IPOs uh, that I should talk about now is we can also break down our deals based on a variety of characteristics. So we can look at some attributes of uh, deals. Let's say we want to look at our free cash flow of a deal. Well, we can break down the deals based on the free cash flow of the target or the acquirer. Next, we can also take a look at all of the deals. If we go over to the deal list that have been proposed or have been announced under the deal list, and we can also search for a particular deal. So I didn't mention this under the IPO section, but you can certainly do the same thing. You can search for a particular IPO uh, using the deal list or the comparable tab in the IPO bar or the IPO section. So that's that. Uh, there's some additional information that you can go through yourself under the IPO and M&A section, but I'll, I'll leave that to you. If you do have any other questions, feel free to hit me up. The last set of functions I'd like to introduce are the functions that allow us to graph certain securities or certain indicators. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the main menu by hitting the escape button, and I'm going to look up some information on the effective federal funds rate. So this is something that you have almost certainly talked about in your previous courses, uh, as of the recording of this video for my class, I know I talked about it last time in class. So let's go ahead and search for the effective Fed funds rate. So we'll just type in federal funds, and you can see that the effective Fed funds rate comes up right here. I'm going to select it. And when I select it, I have a couple of options. I can take a look at the estimates from various economists as to what the effective Fed funds rate is going to be or future at a future period in time. But I'm interested in the line chart option. And this line chart option, this is also available for individual securities like Tesla. I believe it's option 18 on Tesla's main menu. Uh, now, I'm going to go ahead and select the line chart. And what you can see is the effective Fed funds rate for the previous year. And right now, our effective Fed funds rate is right about 2.4%. Now, if we wanted to adjust the time period over which we're looking, we can select various ranges. As you can see, our effective Fed funds rate is a little lower than it has been historically, notably in the early 1980s when it was, well, in some periods, 19%. And change. All right, now let's talk about how we compare the effective Fed funds rate to the target Fed funds rate. So if I wanted to compare one uh, variable to another in Bloomberg, all I would ever have to do in the line chart function is go up to the compare button. So the default typically is an index, so if I were to hit update right now, it would 
add in the S&P 500 index and plot it alongside the, Fed, the effective Fed funds rate. I'm going to get rid of that. And I'm going to search for the target Fed funds rate, which is the Fed funds rate that the Federal Reserve is trying to achieve. So typically they try to keep a Fed fund, an effective Fed funds rate within a range, uh, typically a couple basis points range, like a 25 basis point range or a 50 basis point range. So I'm going to just search for a target of the Fed funds rate. So federal funds target. All right, so we have a couple of choices here. We have the upper bound, we have the midpoint of the range and the lower bound. Uh, let's start with the upper bound. So if I want the upper bound of the federal funds target rate, I just select it and I hit update. And as you can see, the target rate tracks the effective rate pretty accurately. Uh, so let's scale down and take a look at this over a shorter period in time. So as you can see, uh, this yellow line indicates the the upper bound of the target Fed funds rate, and this white line, bordered in blue, indicates the effective rate. If I wanted to add another indicator, let's say the uh, lower bound, all I would have to do is select the lower bound and click update, and you're going to see that our effective rate essentially tracks within the upper and lower bounds. So essentially, once the Federal Reserve uh, actually selects the bounds that it wants the federal funds rate to fall within, uh, it's going to really effectively manage the Fed funds rate uh, through open market operations or some other techniques. So that's that. Now, if I wanted to uh, plot, say, a stock price with alongside another stock price, I could certainly do that using the line chart function. I'll just go through that very quickly by going back to the main menu and going back to Tesla, going to their stock, selecting line chart, and here's Tesla's stock price. Let's compare it to the stock price of Ford, Ford Motor Shares, and Update, and what you can see is that Ford's stock price is plotted alongside Tesla's stock price. If I wanted to add literally anything else to this graph, I certainly could. Let's say I add the Fed funds rate to that. What you're going to see is that uh, the, the effective Fed funds rate is plotted alongside, although what we have here is a couple of different uh, axes, y axes. So this axis is going to indicate Tesla's share price, this one's going to indicate Ford's share price, and this one is going to indicate the effective Fed funds rate. So uh, all of them are just being plotted in the same graph, which looks a bit messy. There's all kinds of techniques that you can use to adjust this. You can uh, scale this any way you want. Uh, you can zoom out. You can look at a various point in time. But we'll get into that in later videos. So I'm going to end here. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me, call me, or stop by and ask me questions both during and after class. So thank you very much.